We now return to Kevin Tachi and Monday Night Talk. Well, that's right. It's Christine James. Again, it's not Kevin Tachi. Kevin Tachi is here in studio with me. He's also the guy behind the uh, camera here as a representative also of Whitman Hanson Community Access Television. And this is part two of our political forum tonight. going to be a little bit interesting, and we're going to talk a little bit about why this is different than any other forum that we have done this primary season. And frankly, I've been here for 28 years. This, the way this whole forum came together, this is also very different than anything we've ever done. We're going to go through everything. Also asking questions with me, our own Charles Matthewson from WATD. You're an old timer too. You've been around here for a while. You know, I'm, I'm at the point where I don't mind you calling me an old timer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, that's good. I, ex I consider myself experienced. Okay, I like that. That's good. And, of course, Kevin Tachi here, the host of Monday Night Talk, asking questions in our own Amy Leonard, who helped put this forum together and is doing all the timing tonight. What forum am I talking about? I'm talking about the race for the U.S. Senate. These are the Republicans. There are three candidates, John Kingston, Jeff Deal, who's the current state rep for the 7th, 7th Plymouth District, which is Whitman, East Bridgewater, and Abington, and Beth Lindstrom, in studio here who is the only candidate that bothered to show up tonight and when I say bothered to show up tonight I have to say in all the years we've been doing these we always tell people if we can't find a time when people get together we will let even if one person shows up we will go on the air because it's not going to stop us from doing our job we've only had to do that I think three times in the 28 years I've been here and this has been one of the most frustrating forums to try to put together um, I just want to say every other race that we're covering this year, we have 100% compliance. So I just want to give a little bit of background before I say good evening again to you, Beth. It's a great outfit, by the way. Thank you. I mean that in a non-sexist <laughs> way. Uh, this is what happened. WATD scheduled this political forum a number of weeks ago. Amy Leonard has been helping me put all these together. Beth Lindstrom accepted right away. No questions, no problems. Tell me when, where I will be there. No games no you know miles and hours of trying to get phone calls returned john kingston accepted personally when amy leonard called him and then we tried to confirm that and made a number of attempts to contact his campaign was it weeks amy mm -hmm. and one of his campaign workers called up and very quickly tried to to pretty much dismiss as oh sorry it's double book we'll see you later it's like just no 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 just a minute so we tried to get a more complete answer. You ended up talking to somebody else, Amy. Was it his wife after that? No, she still didn't call me. Okay, she still hasn't returned your call. Order. Okay. So, and they, saying that uh, he was not available that night, that they'd accidentally double booked him, never said anything about having another night. Now, Jeff Deal, who's been a regular guest on WATD for years, ever since he's run for office, and he's run for several offices, we called his campaign person, sent that invitation weeks ago, took a while to hear back from them. Uh, they said, uh, sorry, that he was already committed for that night, meaning tonight, and that was pretty much it. And we've seen Jeff in the studio so many times. Right, and this is what this is this is what's disappointing. We asked uh, his campaign person to send us dates. He would be available. That person uh, would not do that. And Amy, you spoke to her directly, and it was something about what was it? I did. I tried to send her dates even to see if we could find some other time that mm -hmm. worked, and she just completely disregarded. So we haven't heard that. anything. So correct. I'm I'm disappointed. He's the local guy. He's been here a bunch of times, but we said just because people don't show up is not going to stop us from doing our job. So Beth Lindstrom, we appreciate you being here tonight, and that's exactly why we have one candidate out of the three Republicans that are running for the U.S. Senate, a very important seat here in Massachusetts. So this is going to be a little bit different than our typical forum because mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to, you know, talk back and forth. It's going to be mm -hmm. more like a conversation. And if it's right. an infomercial for you, that's fine because you bothered to make the effort to show up and we really appreciate it. So what I'd like to do is please give us an opening statement and then we'll start asking you some questions. Sure. Well, I'm, I'm going to start by saying thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be here and uh, I appreciate it. It's really disappointing though. And I'm going to talk about the debates here because uh, this is the fourth debate that they have not shown up for. And it's disappointing because it's depriving the voters and the listeners to hear who we are and how we will conduct ourselves in Washington, where we stand on issues, and how, we different, how we're different, how we differentiate. So I want to say um, that I think that's the reason why they're not showing up because we have some real differences, one of which is Jeff is a career politician. 
and someone who's run for multiple offices, as you said, in the three in the past three years. And so for Jeff, uh, when you're a career politician, you say one thing and you do another. And the purest example of that is what we called him on today about a pay raise, where he railed against the pay raise and then um, he took it when no one was looking. And that is when people sour on politicians. So uh, if we want to change what's going on in Washington, we certainly can't send another politician down there. Now, what John Kingston's problem is, is that he funded a third party candidate in the last presidential race. He stepped out of the party. And um, if that person had got traction, then Hillary Clinton would be our president. And now he wants to jump in back into the party and be pro-Trump, where he said Trump could not even run a PTA. He called him evil. So these are some real differences. I've been in the party for 30 years. I have helped to elect, I've been a citizen activist, helped to elect every single Republican governor, Scott Brown, and uh, treasurer, Joe Malone, in the last 20, 30 years. So uh, this, this is about wanting to do the right thing, not looking for a career in politics. So I want to make those uh, differences. And, and if we talk about some issues, we can jump into some of the other issues right. also. But thank you for the opportunity. Oh, absolutely. And it just just so our listeners know, you you just, I believe, taped a forum today. Was it at WGBH yeah, several hours ago? Uh, yeah, it was probably, yeah, yeah. And you were, again, by yourself, so it was basically a Beth Lindstrom infomercial. Well, it was six minutes. It was a pr Jim, <laughs> his, uh, Jim Browdy is a little tougher than an infomercial for me. Uh, he, he asked uh, some questions. I got six minutes. But the point is, he even said in his 20 years, no one has ever not come to a debate for him. Mm -hmm. So I think this is, but, you know, and this is about how people carry themselves. When you are a U.S. Senator and you want to have a good constituent service, if you can't even have this modicum of um, respect for those people who ask things of you, how are you going to conduct yourself as a U.S. Senator? I mean, I, I'm, I just think it's a really uh, bad thing that they are not showing up. Now, what about Channel 5? They had a, what was it, on the record? On, yeah, on we did set? on the record on, on Thursday. On Thursday? On Thursday. It, it, yeah, I'm that? sorry, it aired on Sunday. Yeah, okay. But on Thursday, uh, you know, again, I was the only one that showed up. And um, they talked at the top of the show that said this was supposed to be a debate. And then Sunday night uh, on WBZ with uh, Marissa DeFranco, it was she was supposed to have a debate two hours. Mm -hmm. And neither of them showed up. It's just wrong. So, so if I could ask, in, sure, Kevin so ha have you had, so you've all participated in how many debates so far together? We had one uh, last week, which was the Boston Herald radio, but you could only hear it on bostonherald.com to uh, RSS. Could you describe that debate? And, and did, did anything, was there any questions that were asked that maybe sure. that might have maybe caused this s set of circumstances where well, yeah I think that there's some exposure uh, for for both of them and that's why they don't want to sit at the table and talk about those differences um, we had discussions on questions good content about uh, answering questions how we would uh, answer on different topics um, and at the end um, you know I challenged Jeff about uh, uh, you know some important topics and I think uh, he got you know got, I think that's when I got good you know, and I, people were saying, oh, darn, why can't we continue this? Because, again, it goes to show the differences. Let's talk about those things. I mean, you know, just because, uh, you know, Jeff got uh, the nomination at the convention by the insiders, 2,500 people, actually 1,000 of them left by the time he got the second round of balloting, uh, you know, doesn't mean you can slide into this um, election. I mean, you need to be talking about issues. People can, can hear us. That, you, know, you go from the convention to 300,000 people potentially voting in the primary. Do you, do you recall the question or set of questions that kind of caused, uh, would you say, a little bit I, of discomfort? Uh, I think the, uh, Joe Battenfeld uh, revisited my comments that Jeff Deal was not electable in the general election. And so I think that spurred on, and I, and I did, I called him a career politician. Um, and you can't, if we, again, if we have different perspectives, and I said my perspective is different. I'm a mother, small business owner, been involved in four startup companies, but also have led large organizations, 650 people, 450 people, where you don't always agree on your executive team. You need to be able to have a skill set to be, you know, to get things done. And so I was challenging him on uh, his experience. And uh, I think that's when it got a little bit, uh, uh, you know, him ta ta saying to me that I was a, a political hack. And so then, you know, it got a little bit interesting. So, okay. Charles Matthews, a question for Beth. Beth, when we have had Jeff Deal here, uh, let me point out a, a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, he always has a notebook with laminated pages 
and when asked a question, he needs to turn to the page that might be somewhat relevant to the question and read it. He always reads opening and closing statements. A lot of candidates do. You're sitting here with uh, nothing but a paper cup of water in front of you. Um, just wanted to point that out. There's a difference. Out. Yeah. <laughs> there's, an, uh, there's also a difference in endorsements. Um, you've been endorsed by Bill Weld, Jeff by Paula Page, the governor of Maine. Uh, you have 10 representatives uh, and a senator. Uh, Jeff has six representatives, including uh, Dave DeCoast, uh, locally. Um, you have the endorsement of uh, three women's PAC organizations. Jeff has uh, retired NFL players. Um, you have the endorsement of 18 state committee members the Republican State Committee, but of course he has the party endorsement from the convention. How can you compare and contrast your sure. endorsements and his? Well, I would say first, the only endorsement that matters are the voters out there, the people that I've gone around the state and talked to, the people who I care about listening to, spending time with. To me, that's the most important thing. But endorsements, you know, you do that in a campaign. And I would say I would have even more of those st state reps that are just not vocal about that, I know. But I think it begs the question of the people that are working with Jeff Deal side by side every day up at the state house. wouldn't you think that he would have unanimous support? So that's a question that people should ask. And I know that they believe I'm a better candidate. So I'll take that away from the people who work with him side by side. When you're looking at governors, you know, I've known Bill well for a long time. He's seen my uh, commitment to the party, and he has seen what I have done to be able to elect many people since his governorship. And so I'll take that. You know, he's been a friend for a long time. Uh, when you look at the women's he, he has a good sense of humor. He does. Uh, he's well liked still. <laughs> Paula Page has no humor. Well, I, you know, you got to look at who um, Jeff is aligning himself with, and I, I you know, I'm going to stop there. But, um, but on the women's packs, uh, this is really exciting to be able to have uh, a woman run against Elizabeth Warren, and. I've seen where the Democrats use gender in races before, where they um, against, you know, Martha Coakley with Scott Brown, Elizabeth Warren with Scott Brown. So when Elizabeth Warren starts to say, well, you're, you know, um, criticizing me because I'm a woman, I'll say, nice try. It can't happen. So uh, I think the, these women political packs, I mean, I've gone down to Washington and I actually met with these executive boards. They were so excited. They said, you know what, you have political experience, you've been a you know, citizen activist. You run large organizations. You're a small businesswoman. You can speak clearly. They were, I mean, they were excited because they see that we do have a chance to beat Elizabeth Warren because she is all the opposite. And we can talk about that when the time is ready. But just to focus on your topic, I think that I think that there's a lot of comparison there about who believes who can beat Elizabeth Warren in the fall. Okay, thank you for that response. But you, you never mentioned NFL players. Where are your oh. NFL players? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, um, Steve Diossi, Fred Smurlis. Yeah, what's interesting, because I actually knew those guys from the Scott Brown campaign in the beginning. I think Jeff got to them first before um, I got in the race. I do know when we were in Worcester at the convention, I did have a conversation with a couple of them, and I think I walked away, and they're like, oh, oh. You know, so we'll see. I think they got in early, and but, hey, we'll give them a chance after the primary. We'll give them a chance to jump on board for sure. Brady hasn't endorsed anyone. You know, I, I think, uh, <laughs> I think, like I said, it's really important the people I'm out there meeting and talking to and just listening to their stories. And, and I'll tell you the one thing that excites me, and give me one more minute, because this really is why I'm running. I don't have um, the, the next step on the political ladder in my vision as, you know, Jeff running, you know, for three races in three years. For me, it's about listening to people, hearing what their concerns are. And when you are a U.S. Senator, you're looking at things from a 50,000 foot level. And you're able to connect the dots. You know, just like if you see a manufacturing plant that needs a place to go and you see a gentleman who's running a homeless sh shelter who needs to find jobs for his people. I mean, when you're at that level, you can start to see how you can really bring people together and figure out some problems for them. So anyway, that's what excites me about this race. 
No, Elizabeth Warren is a, a formidable opponent, even though she has, she's got some pretty high negatives here in, mm -hmm. in Massachusetts, and it reminds me almost of some candidates that seem to uh, are liked better outside outside the state, but she's, she's going to be tough to beat. How can you take on and beat Elizabeth Warren in the general election, Beth? Well, the feeling that I get going around this state, and this is where I think we can, the path, the path to winning. I've talked to many Democrats. Now, when you're running in a race, you, know, you get your Republicans, you get your big swath of independents. Try to get into the soft Democrats. But when you have, uh, I want to call them hard Democrats, say to me, Beth, I'm a Democrat. I can't vote for you in the primary, but you have my vote in the general. And when you hear that maybe three times a week, mm -hmm. that's, you know, yes, it's anecdotal, but that's meaningful. And, you know, for Elizabeth Warren, who goes around the country, we have a map on our website of all the cities and towns that I've been to, and we have a map of where she's visited around the country. And you can see where the swing states are. You know she's running for president. But the problem with that is that when she has to make a decision or an opinion or a comment, and she has to pander to her far left, she is in pure conflict with some of the right decisions for people here in Massachusetts. Case in point, last week when she was at the Netroots Nation and then went to um, a, a typically African-American college, or historically, not typically, um, and she was pandering to her audience and called the Justice Department, the justice system, races from front to back. Now, she was in front of an audience that she knows she has to um, be interesting too because you got Cory Booker and you you got Kamala Harris. So she, you know, her statements out of this state were just horrible. I mean, we called on her to apologize to our our law enforcement, everybody in the whole uh, system. She comes back here and she has to dial back her comments. Mm -hmm. So time after time, abolishing ICE, you know, her votes. What has she done, people? You know, what is major legislation that she has passed? Because you can file legislation, but you have to be able to create relationships to get things passed. She's incapable of doing those things. There's so much, I am really excited to have the opportunity to run against her, because I think the people in Massachusetts realize that they are being taken for granted. When you talk to these Democrats that say, I can't vote for you in the primary, but I can vote for you in the general election, is it one or two specific issues that they're with you on? Is this why it's happening? I why think, is it? I think they don't trust her. I think they don't trust her. I think it really is the personality because she is out there running for office, for president. She's and she's not being truthful with people back here. And I think it's part of her, you know, you know, she's going so far left. She's got such an, a progressive agenda that it, it, it differentiates um, even from the Democrats themselves. You know, there's a lot of conservative Democrats or, you know, some of even the hard Democrats just she's gone too far. And especially with the comments that she made last week about labeling our whole um, judicial system and justice system racist, I think people are like, she's just gone too far. Okay. Kevin Tachi, questions for Beth Lindstrom, who's here as one of three candidates that was invited for the Republican and the U.S. Senate seat, along with Jeff Deal and John Kingston. They did not show up. Beth is here. We're asking Beth Lindstrom questions. I, I think... In, in, Immigration reform is probably going to be, if you are the one who's successful on September 4th and you do go up against Elizabeth Warren, probably one of the key issues is going to be immig immigration reform. It's long been in works, but it, it's it, in the works, but for some reason it's one of those top issues that we can't get any kind of consensus. How can we get everybody on the same page when it comes to uh, allowing folks from another country who want to live here legally as compared to those who are here illegally? Sure. I think we have a lot of good people who would want to come to the table and fix it. And we have politicized it for so long that we do need to just fix it. Um, my goal would be to go down there and actually find people who you can work with, create the relationships, meet people. Because again, if you have a goal in mind, you have to be able to get people around the table to say, how do we make some progress? Now, I know there's been some struggles lately, and we'll see where it shakes af out after the midterms. But we have to fix our immigration system. We have to be able to stop telling the rest of the world it's easier to come here illegally, illegally than legally. And I think that's part of why um, she's the wrong messenger. I mean, she goes around the country advocating for sanctuary cities. So she's sending the message telling people to take this terrible trek with their children, put them in harm's way. And, um, and they think that they're going to get sanctuary, and these are false hopes that she's giving out. So we need to stop that. We need to make sure we secure our borders. Uh, 
I think the president did have a deal on DACA. You know, I think there's there are good people who would come to the table to try to do this. I think it has to be comprehensive, though. We have to be able to to come to a compromise. Now, some of that wall was still funded in the first omnibus bill, so it is started. There has been bipartisan workings on on that. I think we can do we can do it. Just another another element to that in regards to immig immigration reform. We know that we've heard. A lot of folks who want to see the elimination of uh, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE. Mm -hmm. uh, are there issues with the agency, uh, or is it just politics as usual? Well, I think that's what Elizabeth Warren, she went down to the border, and then rather than going back to Washington and actually making... Um, you know relationships with people say let's how can we fix it she picks up a bullhorn and goes to Boston and starts talking about abolishing ICE now ICE has two functions it has enforcement and removal and homeland investigations this goes back to sex trafficking drug trafficking all those there's bad stuff that happens in the boards the MS-13 you know trying to to find them so they serve a purpose and they probably you know work under terrible conditions so I would ask Elizabeth Warren what part do you want to make go away now, there's always, as we say, a bad apple in the crate once in a while, just like in any, any organization. But it doesn't mean you, you know, get rid of the whole organization to fix what might need to be tweaked or you need to look at what might be needed to change. But in total, this, I mean, this has existed for years and years. This is just politics for Elizabeth Warren because this, you know, uh, jazzes up her, you know, followers on Twitter, but it's a far cry from her actually representing the people, the con you know, the constituents in Massachusetts. So just to put it musically, as the Osmonds once said, <laughs> one bad apple doesn't spoil the whole bunch, girl. There you go. <laughs> well, thank you, Kevin. <laughs> Kevin, could you, could you have sung that for us? I could have, but people would be turning their radios off. We don't want we that, We don't Charlie. want that. Charles Matthews. We have a nuclear power plant down the road. We're sitting right now in the emergency evacuation zone. Mm -hmm. uh, the the nuke, as we endearingly call it around here, um, was the beneficiary of some tweaked regulations that we wished it wasn't the beneficiary of. As consumer affairs director under in the Romney administration, you did away with some regulations. How do you distinguish between necessary and unnecessary regulations? Yeah, and those are those are that's complicated because everyone. I'm not asking you yeah. the simple question. No, no. Uh, so, this is the Senate, not selectmen. No, I understand that, but I'm saying that each regulation has to be considered in the context of the present. So depending on what it was at the time, um, you know, that's where we make the decision. So you have to weigh it. You have to weigh the benefits to the cost, and and you know, the example there. I, I, I will not act like I remember all of everything back in back then. But I think um, you know you have to weigh the benefits. Now you have state regulations, and then you have federal regulations, and sometimes that FERC can over you know override what you have put in place in the state level. So I mean, there are different levels of regulation also. Some Republicans. I know that's a generalization, will uh, say that most regulations are burdensome, they're bad for small business, and should go away. Uh, I like to bring I think up. there's a balance. Yeah, there so really how, balance. how do you achieve that balance? Well, what but, but what are the uh, things that go into the cost-benefit analysis for you? Well, I, you know, I think that you have to, f it, it depends on each one. I, you, I, I don't think you can generalize um, on that because some of them are very different. I mean, you look at uh, gift cards and, and having uh, businesses have to pay back the state coffers on gift cards that may have never been, um, you know, cashed. I'm, you know, that's a burden on a small business owner trying to create a small business. So, uh, you know, yeah. So the benefit there is to encourage people to s create the business because you're going to create jobs. Now, if there's something that could be detrimental to the employee in a regulation, um, then that's a different story. So uh, you know, it just takes a balance, and I think you have to look at everyone individually. Health? I don't think that there's one you know broad brush that you can you can say. I, it just takes a balance. How about health? Yeah. Regulations that protect health. Well, I, again, that's so general. I mean, you're trying to you know pinpoint mm -hmm. me to a to something, and I, and I'm not going to answer it because I, it's just it's yeah. Do you care about health? We all care about health. So health of what? Health of the employee, health of the owner, health of the business. What is the health? So, do you see what I'm trying to 
mm -hmm. get back to you. It's just not an easy answer. But the way I would govern, or I would, I'm not a governor, but I would represent, is to get all the facts on the table, as we'd always. Listen to both sides, because you're going to have both sides, and then try to figure out what is the best um, avenue to go, depending on what the need is at the time. It's, it's, it's fact-driven a lot, but it's also a little bit of empathetic, um, you know, who's in the situation. But, the, I mean, you're, you're talking from small regulations to, you know, the FERC deciding to locate a, uh, a nuclear plant. I think there's a lot in between there. Um, one, uh, one last shot at this. Uh, I know some cranberry growers, uh, they use a lot of gasoline on bogs, and gasoline and cranberries don't really mix mm -hmm. well. Uh, there was a, an EPA regulation a few years ago that required a, uh, a fumeless gas can. Mm -hmm. Problem is that it leaked gasoline, and so everyone just took the, the nozzle off and poured the gasoline in directly and put the can down, which of course let the fumes go out, was a regulation that did the opposite of what it was intended mm -hmm. to do. How mm -hmm. would you respond to that? Yeah, well, I think there are, and again, that's probably not a federal issue, is it? It was EPA. Is it EPA? Okay, all right. Well, um, yeah, I would think that health matters. I mean, I, I'm a big proponent of wellness, of uh, clean air. I like that. I think that those are important. So again, it's the balance of, but the, does it put the cranberry grower out of business? Is there some, is there a happy medium? You know, you will always have two sides coming at each other and, and, it, and who decides? I mean, if you're putting out someone, is there a compromise? You know, hallelujah, what if there is a compromise? You know, is there some other technology that could be used to solve the problem? Old gas cans. Yeah. <laughs> Well, right. So maybe it's new gas cans. I don't, you know, I, you know, again, you're giving me an example and trying to, you know, say, okay, what would you do here? I mean, I, I need to understand it more. Ms. James. <laughs> Thank you very much. What are your thoughts about Social Security? Do you think it needs mm -hmm. to be changed? Do you think it's fine the way it is? Should we be looking in different directions? Should we pay people more money, less money? What well, my mom's on, on Social Security, and I don't want to do. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, and I wouldn't want to do anything to harm her. But we have to be realistic, and we have to make sure that we're being honest with the, our young people who are coming into the system. And there might be some tweaks that we could do, you know, that for people who are far from, you know, collecting Social Security. And maybe that is we are living longer. You know, we, we maybe we can, you know, tweak the age a little bit. I think you have to, you look at the numbers and you got to look at the, the program in total. And then you have to look at the program in total to the bigger budget. You know, I don't think you can look at anything in isolation. I always talk about zero-based budgeting. You know, even in government, I actually wrote business plans because you have to figure out what do you want to do and how are you going to fund it? What are your demographics? What are your numbers? I mean, it's it, a lot of it could be analytical. So do we need to make sure that people have this social safety net absolutely mm -hmm. uh, how can we make it better could there be you know cost um, increases cola increases yeah that would be great but how do we do it so um, you you do have to look in everything in total um, and if there are ways to incent by other um, giving tax credits for younger people for putting their own plans together combinations so that we can continue to encourage people to save um, because social security really it was um, initiated as an extra benefit mm -hmm. and you know that way back in the, in the day it was so um, it's morphed a little bit so if we can go back to un the having the culture understand the need for that and what they need to do for themselves too, you know people who are starting right now saving their money then there might be some solutions there too okay so no, you don't see any big changes coming. Let's say I don't. People I don't see any uh, big changes where it becomes you know catastrophic for anybody. Okay, I'm just curious about that, Kevin Tachi. Share your opinion in regards to foreign policy. Right now, we're on the cusp of mm -hmm. a trade war, whether mm -hmm. it's with China, whether it's with Canada. We know that, that there's a lot that was there's been a lot of problems with uh, the North American Free Trade Agreement, mm -hmm. NAFTA. Um, what do you think needs to be done in regards to putting together legislation where we can compete in the global market and yet still, you know, have it fair and equitable for other countries to 
also be part of that global so talking about tariffs i'm a free trade person but it has to be fair trade okay. and i think that we need to look at um these policies and decide um you know what we need to do to get them back to balance they should be short and targeted now you look at what the president did at the g7 he went up there and he said you know what? let's all just have free trade let's just stop it all i mean no one bit and then you know came back and he had the conversation with the EU and now they're dropping some of their tariffs. You know, would it have been maybe better to do one area at a time to see if the model worked? But I think the ultimate goal was China. I truly think so. And I've been out there talking to businesses where whether it's a brewery whose aluminum price has gone up, whether it's the uh, you know, garden and landscape guy with his you know one percent increase on his on his lawnmowers. So we are seeing this, but I think um, I think we need to. We I'm a peace through strength person, and I would say that we have to be tough and ride out the wave a little bit, give it some time to be able to to tell China that their behavior is bad, and they've got to feel some pain to be able to fix it. You know, it's like a consequence. I have three boys. It's like if you say, okay, you know, don't steal the cookie, don't steal the cookie, don't steal the cookie. And there's no consequence. Well, there's no, there's no reason to change your action. So it's the same thing. It's, it's like China. You know, you've been stealing our IP. You, you demand things um, from our businesses, and you put us in a, you know, a, a sub-competitive position. Limited market. Right? Yeah. So, you know, like I said, I, maybe having it all happen at once is a little bit, you know, worrisome for our, but markets always, you know, uh, go up and down with external forces. we got to give it some time and let them, hopefully, we'll, you know, get back to some balance because that's what they should, short, targeted, and go away. What, what do you stand with this administration, with, with the president? Are you a Trump supporter? And I, I'm setting this up as for a follow-up. What, what do you stand sure. in a short, give me a short answer. Sure, my short answer is that I support the president when it's right for people in Massachusetts, disagree when it's not, always respect the office of the president, but I don't work for the president. I work for the people of Massachusetts. I would as a U.S. Senator. Um, I agree with him on policies like we just talked about. Right. I disagree on the three T's, tone, temperament, and Twitter. Maybe a little bit more <laughs> diplomacy. <laughs> I hope that's trademarked. <laughs> that's good. Not yet. That would be, a, that would be the <laughs> yeah, fourth T. Yeah. <laughs> I'm all set. Well, to, okay. uh, to expand on that, one, one mm -hmm. of Christine's favorite questions, if I may. Oh, I know oh, it's no, coming. it's not going to be about coming. Plymouth County government. No, no. Uh, <laughs> no, what type of? <laughs> what type of Republican are you? Are you more a Bill Weld Republican or more and, a Donald Trump? And don't say a Beth Lynch. I am. That's my answer. No, I'm no. a Beth Lynch from right, Republican. This, give us the second answer. No, then. okay, the second answer is I'm the type of person... Who am I? I'm a mother. I'm a small business owner. I have had great opportunity to run large organizations. The skill set that I have is to be able to get people work across the aisle, be able to introduce auto insurance competition, introduce hi-fi programs, high school financial literacy, working with Democrats. It's That's who I am, someone who can work with people. If you are somebody who just blindly follows the president, like Jeff Deal, then that's not going to help us here. It's not. And you have, you know, John Kingston, who was, you know, a, a never Trumper. That's not going to, you know, I don't know why he thinks he can make progress. You need somebody who has the ability to create relationships with a lot of different people. That's the skill set. That's the personality. And someone who cares about actually helping people in the Commonwealth and not looking for the next step on the political ladder. You know, we go back to term limits. I, you know, I'm not in it to, do, to do, look for the next step. It's to actually help people. So that's the type of Republican I am. So you 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 eventually want to be is it vice president? Or you <laughs> oh no, 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 no. Actually, someone who has some empathy for other people's situations. Now, I, I mean, are you thinking that all Republicans aren't empathetic, or you know? No, no, I didn't uh, so, say that. I was just wondering. Uh, so I, you know, I don't know in terms of terming what type of Republican. I've been in the Republican Party thirty years. I started with Ray Shammy. Now. You know, that's a long time ago. Mm -hmm. I was the first woman executive director of the state party, helping to elect enough state senators to sustain Governor Weld's veto. You know, I ran Scott Brown's campaign. So you look at the people who I've been aligned with, with Bill Weld, Paul Salucci, yes, rest his soul, Joe Malone, Scott Brown, Mitt Romney, and Charlie Baker as president of the Super PAC that helped him. So, you know, there's a lot there. Pick one. Which one do you like? And, I'm, <laughs> and, and I've been friends with them. So, but to help them on conservative fiscal uh, Republican issues. Well, to get to issues, um, I have a bunch of questions that begin, should Congress, I'll just pick one from the list, should Congress 
require universal background checks. On, on guns? guns? Okay, I'm just uh, on life. No, no, on on the, background you know. checks on <laughs> life. God, I'd fail <laughs> that. Uh, I, yes. You, you know, I, I'm a Second Amendment supporter, and I believe that people have, you know, the right to defend themselves, but also for, you know, hunting and, and recreation. Um, my dad, you know, was a gun owner. So I think it's an important constitutional right. I do. Because if you take that away, what other ones are you going to take away? But I think we need to make sure that uh, we don't put guns in the hands of those who shouldn't have them. And I think that's real important. My dad has dementia now, so he doesn't have those guns in his house anymore. And that's important. So, yeah, I think universal background checks, we need to make sure that we uh, don't um, you know, punish a law-abiding uh, citizen, the class of citizens. Let's target the bad actor. Because I say, too, when, you know, this past year we had the kid who stabbed the girl with a knife in the Winchester Library. You have in my hometown in Groton last fall, and I know exactly where I was because I grabbed my, grabbed my baseball bat next to my couch because um, he took a baseball bat and bludgeoned his, his grandparents and his mother. I just got news that there was four murder, three murders in town. So, you know, how do I defend myself? I don't know who's in my back door. So, yeah, you know, but it wasn't a gun. There's intentions from people. That's the mental health part. There are people who shouldn't have um, guns. But if someone wants to hurt someone, they're going to hurt someone. we got to find those bad actors. Yeah, but most violence is not with knives or baseball bats. And I know that I've, I've been threatened with uh, a knife a couple of times. It's not a, a pleasant thing. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems like the simplest of moves to require background checks. I think I said, I, yeah. I said, yeah. Yeah. I don't okay. know if you heard that. No, yeah. I just wanted to okay. reinforce. That. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I was going to ask if you were a shark or a jet there, Charlie. I wasn't quite sure for a second. Okay. Do you want to sing now? <laughs> no, I'll do that afterwards. Uh, let, let me ask you a little bit about sure. immigration. Mm -hmm. Whether you call them illegal immigrants or undocumented, that seemed to be an issue that's kind of gone on this, I was going to say this semester, this session with, uh, prim with primary candidates. What, what needs to be done with the immigration system here in the United States? Is, do you think it's a mess? Do you think it's fixable? Do you think it needs some tweaks or it needs to be overhauled? I think it needs to be overhauled. I think we need to, I mean, you look at these uh, kids and this whole family detention, family separation issue. Now, I'm not for family separation. I'm for family detention, but still, it's not a, a catch and release. I mean, people are breaking the law when they come over illegally. There's 46 ports of entry. If they are claiming asylum, there's a way to to do that and not be separated from your children, but also to, um, you know, to file correctly. Do it the right way. For too long, we've been sending the message that it's easier to come here illegally. I mean, all our, I mean, my, you know, my great grandfather came from Sweden years ago, came through, changed his name from Ekstrom to, to Ek, and, uh, you know, built a house in Worcester in, uh, behind Holy Cross. And, you know, you know, that's how a lot of us came here. And the people who I talk to who came here legally are the ones who are the most vocal about doing it the right way. But we have a problem and we need to fix it. I mean, there are people, um, you know, who've contributed to our society, and we need to, you know, put that into consideration depending on what together as a Congress you could come up with to fix it. Um, you know, we've got DACA. I mean, these kids didn't come here on their own, you know, um, uh, accord. So I think that there should be some, some conversation about how making sure that they could get some legal status. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we've got a lot of these moving parts that need to be fixed. And part of that is securing our border. I mean, it's when you look at the numbers of, of you know, in a month and a half and you have 2,000 kids, you have 30,000 people coming. We've got a problem. We have a problem. We can't absorb all that. Um, and, and, you know, we need to know who's here in our country. We need to make sure some of those kids coming over came with, you know, uh, the coyote, the, the person who brought them across the border and the, and the young girl gets birth control. I mean, these are horrible stories. And you talk about the MS-13 gangs that are in, in our suburbs and around the cities in Boston. I mean, bad stuff happens at the border. Drugs, there, it, a lot happens. We have to fix it. It will help our immigration system to be able to fix it. We need to 
Yeah, I think it's a big overhaul comprehensive okay. program. You know what I want to do? I want to, Kevin and Charlie, a question to ask Beth a couple of lightning round questions. Mm -hmm. This is either yes or no or one or two sentences. Okay, okay. And then we'll let you go to make your final statement, whatever you want to okay. tell our listeners. Okay, thank Lightning you. round question. One word that describes you. Um, a listener. Notice how men never say that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I shouldn't make that editorial comment. Charlie? Uh, are we the enemy? No. The three of us. No. You want me to elaborate? Because I was one thinking. sentence. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know the media plays a critical role in our democracy, and most of the time, if you get it wrong, you'll you'll say you made the Always. mistakes, right? So I mean, it's a it's a vital role. Okay, Kevin. Where do you get your real news? What do you what are your sources? I the Wall Street Journal. Um, I look at the Boston Globe, the Worcester Telegram. And that's about as much as I can fit in. One more quick question, Charlie. Uh, should, Congre uh, should Congress incentivize uh, wind and solar? Yes. Okay. But let me finish one quick. Okay. I think we need to be able to solve our problems of alternative energy. We need to put a big, big effort. I think you know we need to invest heavily, like into the battery research, research and development, if we really, really want to solve our problem. Okay. You've got a minute <laughs> to okay. tell our listeners anything that you want to tell them about sure. yourself and your candidacy, Beth Lindstrom for uh, U.S. Senate. And again, Beth was the only one of the three candidates who said yes right away and showed up here to the debate. And we're, as we found out earlier, this wasn't the only situation or debate where this happened. We appreciate you so much for being here. So thank you. tell our listeners what they need to sure. know about your candidacy. Well, let me say thank you for the opportunity to be here. I take it seriously, and I wish my opponents did also. Uh, Beth for Senate, B-E-T-H-F-O-R, Senate.com is where you can find information about myself and my campaign. But here's the, here, here's the crux of it all. If we want to be able to beat Elizabeth Warren in the fall, we need to put up our best candidate. I have a record. I have accomplishments and where I stand on the issues. If I am nominated when I am nominated in September, I would be the very first Republican woman ever in Massachusetts to run for U.S. Senate as a Republican. And I think that's a, that's a big deal. You're showing young people that uh, you can run as a Republican and what does that stand for? Um, to be able to work with our Governor Charlie Baker and our Lieutenant Governor Karen Polito. But anyway, back about me. So I, um, I've had a long history. My intention is to go down there and actually get things done, create relationships. I've done it my whole career. And I think that's really important. If you look at current U.S. Senator Elizabeth Warren, she's incapable. You look at Jeff Deal, why, you know, the majority of, of his colleagues think that I'm a better candidate. You got to ask those questions. Okay. So thank you. Thank you very much, Beth Lindstrom, for joining us here. Thank you, Kevin Tachi. And thank you also, Charles Matthewson, Whitman Hansen community cable access. Again, this video is going to go out statewide. This whole interview is going to go up on our website, and we will also have selected cuts for you. Thank you, Amy Leonard, for helping us put all this together tonight. And as you tell people, get out there and vote. If you don't vote, you don't have a voice. I'm Christine James. Stay tuned for more right here on 95.9 WATD.